Good afternoon. Um, good morning to some of our attendees and even good evening to our attendancy. Would like to welcome you very much to our um, coffee webinar. Um, thank you very much for taking your time um, to attend us. And we would like to start first to have um, our thoughts and prayers to all our um, attendancy and the people and our um, participants in our projects in Central America who have been uh, hit very, very hard by the hurricane um, Eta. Just know that we are there with you, although we, are, we can only do that with you from the online situation due to the COVID situation we are now uh, in currently. Um, we have some technical information just before we start. We have muted all uh, microphones and all cameras. Um, and we are um, in the menu of the GoToWebinar. On, on your right hand side, you have the possibilities to put your questions. Um, we will monitor your questions during this webinar. And at the end of the, the webinar, we would have time for questions uh, regarding the presentations that you will have. And if we have too many questions, then we shall gather all the questions for you and send the answers to you after the webinar. So all questions will be answered. Um, and we ask you a special attention if the webinar is finished. Could you please um, hold on a moment to the webinar because we would like to do a survey on our webinars and you will get a pop-up on your screen. And it just takes a very, uh, even less than a minute to fill out this survey, but it would help us very much um, on, on our findings for our webinars. Um, Gustavo, next, please. Um, we, I'll give you a very, very short um, introduction um, on myself, on our, um, on, on Gustavo and Lisanne, who will do the uh, the, the uh, presentation for you, and just a little bit uh, about CBI. Although maybe uh, many of you know us already, but just a brief uh, introduction. My name is Jantine Rutte. I am the um, pro uh, program manager for market intelligence studies for the CBI. And I do uh, amongst um, I do three sectors: so um, home decoration, home textiles, cocoa, and of course coffee. That's why I'm here today. My background is I've been a green coffee trader for over 25 years, um, so I have some uh, experience in coffee. And um, next, please, uh, Gustavo. Just a small uh, explanation CBI. We have a mission with, within CBI is that we would like to connect um, our small to medium sized exporters in developing countries to the European market. And that, with that, we would like to contribute to a sustainable um, and an inclusive economic growth. We have um, within CBI, we have um, target countries. Um, you see them here on the screen. It's it's quite a lot. We are active in uh, in in big parts of uh, of this world. Um, <clears throat> we have we have a focus on 14 sectors, and um, today, of course, we focus on coffee. But here you can see the other products that we are focused on. Um, um, we within our um, work we have um, divided us ourselves into target groups we have of course the small to medium size exporters that we focus on we focus on bso so uh, business support organization governmentally and non-governmentally we work together with policymakers, and of course we work with the um, importers based on the european uh, market and the and the uk market we have um, our uh, core competences within our uh, work in CBIs is that we do first um, company training, um, a company coaching. We do a, a lot of training. We help um, the small to medium sized experts in, the, in their enabling uh, environment uh, support. And we facilitate um, European Union market entry information. And of course, that's why we're here today in this webinar is that we have a lot of European, um, Europe, Europe, European uh, market um, entry information on the market intelligence. And um, that is why we are here together for this uh, webinar. So our studies on market um, intelligence um, 
provide a different kind of information, which is divided into the market analyze part. So what is the demand, for example, in Europe and what are the trends and what kind of opportunities can you take out of this? And we have the studies that are based on the market entry. That is like finding buyers, how to export, um, how to do business and um, what are your market um, uh, re buyer requirements. And besides these two uh, modules, we make country fact sheets on, uh, on, the, co on the coffee sector. So for example, on, on Germany or in Russia or in, on the uh, UK or, or France. And we can um, provide tailored made fact sheets on certain coffee subjects so like organic or sustainability. Uh, we have all our information on our website. Here is how you enter it's to the cbi.eu and then to uh, market information where you can find our sectors. You can click on it and um, then you can, for example, go to the coffee part. You click on, on coffee and there you can find our different kind of um, studies we make. You can find all your information there you can look it up. You can uh, read it online, you can download it, you can forward it, you can save it. And all this information is for free. Um, so it's, it's good to read, it's, it's, it's very helpful. Um, I think this is more, it's enough about us. Uh, it's time for our presentation. Um, our presentation today will be to learn more about how to map our markets, find bars to optimize your opportunities. This part will be uh, hosted by um, Gustavo Ferro, who will in introduce himself um, more about his background. And then the second part is um, what are um, the online tools we could, uh, you could use um, to optimize your opportunities. And this will be hosted uh, by Lisanne, who will also um, tell more about herself um, during her presentation. So enjoy very much. And Gustavo, I give you the online floor. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess everyone can hear me and see me. I think that's a yes. Uh, I'm Gustavo Ferro. Uh, I'm the lead researcher for the coffee and cacao sectors for CBI. And in fact, I've been working on the cacao sector as a, as a, a researcher for CBI since 2008, together with Jos Piero, who's attending this webinar as well. Uh, with uh, Jeroen Kruft and some other experts. And right now I work on behalf of uh, Profound Advising Development. I'm an associate expert for this company that specializes in the promotion of natural ingredients and uh, sustainable trade. Um, other work that I have done in coffee has also been for CBIs, the value chain analysis for Central America, uh, some different activities within the Peru and the Colombia programs. Uh, and as well for other organizations like uh, UNCTAD, where I am finishing a project on roasted coffee from Ethiopia and in Central America together with Kati. Uh, my LinkedIn is here if you guys want to check my profile and if you want to check the, the website of Profound. I'll just allow maybe Lizanne to open her audio to introduce herself. Hi everyone, thank you so much for attending. My name is Lisanne Grotas. Um, as Gustavo already said, I'm a consultant at Profound Advisors in Development, and we are much focused on uh, facilitating trade promotion and sustainable, uh, supporting sustainable sourcing and linking uh, natural ingredients producers to the market. Uh, my key expertise is mostly in, 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 in market research, mainly for coffee and cocoa. Um, most of the year I'm based in Bogota, uh, Colombia. Now I'm in the Netherlands um, and my background is in international development and uh, journalism. So I will close my webcam again so Gustavo can continue. All right, thank you Lisa. Uh, maybe just to continue, as uh, Jantina already introduced, the CBI website where you can find all this information. Uh, and just a tip for you guys, if English is not your main language, you can also open the pages and use the translate function of your browser so that you can read all this information in your native language. So this is a nice tip so that you can access this information in your own language. Uh, and of course, we always try to write in a way that is also very uh, instructive and trying to write in a simple way so that it's actually uh, accessible information and very and useful information as well for you guys. Uh, so today we will discuss a few issues. I want to start just by uh, 
maybe testing the water a little bit as to how COVID is, is affecting us all in the coffee market and what we can expect for the future in terms of these online tools and uh, linking that a little bit with finding buyers. And then I'll just speak a little bit about uh, how to prepare the ground, how to prepare yourself to actually use the tools to find buyers. And then I'll give the ground, uh, I'll, I'll uh, give the floor to Lizanne, who will then talk about the specific tools and some tips for you guys to use uh, in order to find buyers now that we are not able to go to trade fairs and events. And then we are going to open the floor for some questions and discussion as well. So this is basically the agenda for today. Uh, it's a short presentation, but we are hoping to give you guys some useful tools and uh, some tips that you can actually use in your business. And if you're in an organization that you can guide your members as well. Uh, so basically what we see uh, in terms of COVID affecting the coffee market, we see that let's say the consumption of coffee, uh, of coffee per se has not been so much affected as has been the way of consuming coffee. We know that trade fairs, festival, cupping, events, and all these things have been canceled. So we're all trying to find a way to deal with things online. And on the consumption side, we see that one of the lead channels that was driving the specialty market, which is the coffee shops, they are currently uh, mostly closed in Europe and uh, people are taking coffee on the go or they're increasing their home consumption. So even though, uh, as you can see in this funny Instagram picture, coffee is relatively stable in terms of consumption. People need coffee, people want to consume coffee. The actual consumption patterns have changed. Uh, so it has never been more relevant actually to replace some of these real life experiences to actually online, because we see that a lot of buyers, a lot of you guys, suppliers, you are actually developing re relationships online and you're, you're trying to maintain your relationships through using some online tools. Uh, we do have, of course, some uh, information on the website of, um, of CBI regarding finding buyers and doing business, but we have adapted this format a little bit now to online, and this is what we are presenting to you guys. Uh, so just think about how uh, you're not having some of these real life experiences and how to replace that with these online tools. Think about, for example, how you would go to a trade fair and you would accidentally meet someone interesting. How can you do that now? that you don't have this accidental, accidental experiences. How can you be more active in terms of finding the right buyer for you? So this is basically the idea here. Um, what I do uh, want to emphasize though, is that uh, even though finding buyers is the, is the request number one, when we speak to coffee producers, exporters, it is not that simple. I mean, uh, there is no universal magic list of uh, coffee buyers that applies to everyone. This is a tailored thing. So that's why blind matchmaking does not work. Uh, you need to know the supplier, you need to know the buyer, and there needs to be a chemistry in order to match as well. So uh, different markets will also have different structures and the, the possibilities will be different as well. Uh, and as well, you need to understand the big picture. You need to understand market dynamics, if the market is concentrated. And uh, when you're approaching buyers, what I do experience sometimes is that a lot of exporters and producers, they send generic emails that will end up in the spam box of a buyer or in aggress a very aggressive commercial email uh, that actually generates reputational risks and can actually jeopardize future attempts to connect. So how can we make this more tailored? How can we uh, fine tune this approach a little bit more? And ideally, you're actually looking for commercial partnerships that have mutual benefits. A buyer is looking for a good product and you as a supplier are looking for a good buyer. Uh, and this means a shared vision, uh, matching expectations, and a suitable product market combination. What does that mean? I'm going to explain to you. Um, so get ready, prepare yourself to actually find buyers. It's not a random exercise. It's actually something that requires some preparation. Uh, where to start? Well, first you should look at the big picture. So let's look at some trade figures, some facts, and some dynamics of the market, because this will help you focus your search. Uh, so I'm going to show you guys a little bit of that, and then I'm going to show you a little bit of how to zoom in, how to then select a specific market and understand the market structure in the target market and identify who is who in this market so that you can filter your search a little bit more. And then how to characterize if a buyer is interesting for you or not, if it's a suitable partner for you or not, uh, how to create parameters to identify the important aspects of this buyer to you. And finally, uh, <laughs> Last but not least, 
uh, how to use the tools uh, to search and match with buyers. So how to find uh, suitable buyers in your target markets and how to tailor your approach. This will be explained to you by Lizanne so that you guys need to stick around because the most interesting part of the presentation maybe is going to be presented by Lizanne, which is actually the most important uh, tools that you guys can use for that. Well, just to start, uh, when we're looking at uh, the European market in terms of uh, the coffee consumption, you see a mixed kind of picture because you're talking about the large markets. Uh, you see here in the, in the orange stars that the large markets are also the ones that have a large population. So you see Germany, France, Italy as being the lead markets for coffee in terms of volume because they do have a big consumption for a big population. And then you see Poland, Spain, Netherlands. Uh, and then you look at the per capita consumption of coffee and then it shows a little bit uh, of a different picture because you see countries like uh, the Nordic countries like Finland, Norway, Iceland, Denmark, and then Netherlands, Sweden again, having a very high average yearly consumption of coffee. So that's showing a little bit of a mixed uh, picture as to which markets could be interesting for you. Uh, you have so many options here. You have options of niche markets, you have options of big markets. How do you start looking at market entry? And when you look at market entry, what is important here is for you to understand how the coffee enters the European market. What is your entry point and what is this first buyer to you? So understanding the import figures will be very important here. Um, in Europe, so 86% uh, more or less of European imports of coffee, uh, they are sourced directly from producing countries. And the other 14%, they are sourced via other European hubs. Uh, the main destinations for uh, European imports are Germany, Italy, Belgium, Spain, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily the most important countries for you. Uh, it just means that the coffee is mostly entering those markets as a first point. Uh, let, let's do an exercise where we actually um, look at specific target markets and we ask ourselves the following questions. Are those countries uh, importing directly or indirectly from producing countries? Uh, when we look at the import figures, where are these countries importing from? So when looking at the trade flows, when looking at German imports, when looking at Italian imports, are these countries sourcing from uh, various producing countries, uh, coffee producers? Is this a diverse uh, uh, range of suppliers or is it very concentrated in Brazil and Vietnam, for example? Uh, are there a lot of competitors for your coffee on this market? Are these uh, countries already importing from your country? And uh, if you're producing specialty coffee, is this a market that is actually importing from a lot of specialty producers? Uh, what can it say about whether this country is interesting for you or not? This is important to ask yourself. And as well, it's important for you to start asking yourself what European hubs actually fuel the market. So for example, if a country is not importing directly, uh, through which country is this country important from? Uh, these are some important questions to ask yourself in terms of the big picture, in terms of understanding the trade flows uh, per destination, destination market there, that you're looking at. Uh, let's look at the case of the Netherlands, for example. So uh, you do have here the imports of the Netherlands in terms of uh, volume and in terms of value. Uh, you see the Netherlands accounts for around 5% of, Euro of European imports in total. Uh, but then you start get, digging into these figures and then you see, for example, that 66% uh, of uh, Dutch imports, they're actually sourced via other European hubs. So you see the role of Belgium here is super important. Germany also has an important role in supplying the Netherlands with coffee. Uh, the direct imports from producing countries, at least in terms of figures, you only have 34% of the total imports. You see markets like Brazil, Vietnam, Colombia, Honduras, the big producers as being the main suppliers to the Netherlands. And then you have others like Peru, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Indonesia, Ethiopia, and Uganda with uh, a lower share, but also an important role in, in the Netherlands in terms of supply in the country. Uh, so you should start asking yourself, should start uh, uh, wondering whether this country can be an interesting target market for you or not. Is it interesting to expl explore further or do you need more information? Uh, and then we look at the case of Finland, for example, where 90% of the imports, they're actually coming from producing countries and only 10% intra-European. So this actually looks like it's quite an interesting market because a high share is actually coming from uh, producing countries. And as we saw before, Finland has a very high per capita consumption of coffee as well. Of course, the volumes of the mar this market are also lower. So you're looking 
when you're looking at the producing countries, you don't see Vietnam, for example. And this shows us a little bit about the focus of this country in the specialty market. You see countries that you did not see in the Netherlands, for example, you see uh, emerging suppliers like Kenya, you see Rwanda here as well. I know that you have participants from Rwanda in this webinar. So you start asking your, your uh, um, start asking the question, is this an interesting market instead of other ones for me? Am I really specialized? Do I have small volumes? And is there space for me in this market? Or do I need more information? Uh, if you do need more information, of course, you should uh, not only look at the trade figures, and uh, I give you guys some websites here where you can investigate the trade figures by yourself. You can repeat this exercise with other countries. You can repeat this exercise with Germany, Italy, uh, so that you can ask yourselves these questions. And this presentation, of course, will be available later. Uh, the video of this presentation will be available later, and then you can check this website. But for you to understand specific markets, what is important here is that you understand the buyer landscape as well. Uh, you need to ask yourself, is this a very concentrated market? Even though some markets are big, they're very concentrated around one, two big players. Uh, who are the main players here? Am I talking about the, the large scale uh, importers, the multinationals? Am I talking about uh, specialized importers that focus on uh, specialty coffees or certified coffees? Uh, am I speaking about uh, maybe large scale roasters, you know, this, uh, these roasters that have different brands and product lines? Or does my market consist of many small roasters that are sourcing small volumes of excellent quality, uh, single origins, uh, and direct trade? So this is where you can start understanding where uh, is the market for you? What are the what is the mainstream market and where are the niche markets for you in this in these specific countries? Uh, for this exercise, we have actually given you some fact sheets. Uh, we do produce in the context of the market intelligence. We produce some fact sheets where you can check each country, and then you can check uh, what the buyer landscape is in in those target markets, so that you can start selecting whether these are interesting markets for you or not. And uh, what is also important here is that you start creating some parameters to analyze the buyer. So what makes a buyer interesting for you? Is it the size of the company? Are you interested? And do you have the scale to work with the large uh, multinationals, the large importers? Uh, or is it something more for small scale for more specialized buyers? Uh, does the minimum requirements in terms of volume or quality influence uh, you going to this market or not? Uh, does this buyer require minimum values that are not feasible for you? Uh, is the quality level also maybe too high for you? Are you looking into 80 uh, plus in your helping scores? Or are you talking about lower than 80? Do the buyer, uh, does the buyer have these specific requirements? Uh, what segment are we talking about? Are you, does your quality qualify you to be in the specialty segment or you're more looking to the mainstream segment? Uh, what are the activities of this buyer? Are you looking into uh, supplying directly to the roaster or through an importer? Or even maybe you, you'd be looking at a retailer that has uh, roasting facilities as well. Uh, what is the company mission? Does it match with your mission? Uh, sometimes buyers that have specific uh, sustainability requirements, for example, they do have a special interest in sourcing from maybe uh, all women's cooperatives or uh, cooperatives that actually have a focus on agroforestry systems. Uh, does your philosophy match this buyer? And also uh, sometimes buyers have a geographical focus. For example, maybe there are buyers, uh, maybe roasters and importers that specialize in Africa or specialize in Latin America. Uh, this you should understand and sh you should do this exercise when you're creating your parameters as well. And also who's their end client? Who is going to be consuming this coffee? This you also should check when you're checking whether a buyer is suitable for you or not. So in short, you should start thinking about it and start creating your own parameters to analyze the buyers that uh, Lizanne will try to explain to you. Uh, she will present to you guys some tools that you can use to do this exercise. So I will hand this over the presentation over to Lizanne. And uh, if you guys have any questions about it or any clarification, clarification questions, just write in the chat and we'll try to answer these questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Great, Gustavo, thank you. Um, so as Gustavo just explained, um, I will um, in more detail have a look at where and how to look for buyers. And 
as Gustavo emphasized or said, I would emphasize again that it's very important to realize that there is no universal list of buyers, nor is there an ideal buyer. But by exploring interesting markets, uh, identifying an interesting buyer profile for your product offer, for the thing, the product, the coffee you have to offer, um, your search for potent potential interesting buyers um, can become uh, a lot more effective and efficient. So I will use, um, or I will explain how you can use uh, the websites of sector and trade associations, as well as websites of uh, coffee festivals and fairs and uh, certification bodies uh, and, and databases as a tool uh, or as a source to find uh, buyers. So next slide, please. Uh, so to start uh, with the sector and trade associations, uh, as you know, there are many uh, associations in the uh, in the coffee sector, uh, both in producing countries as well as in uh, consuming countries. Um, and to know whether an association uh, is is or could be a potential source uh, for for uh, for buyers for you, it's quite important to check the objectives, uh, define the objectives uh, of that uh, particular association as well as their geographical scope. Um, and in addition, also uh, to define their position in the value chain. For instance, you have associations. Um, let's say you are an exporter of, of um, high quality specialty green coffee, um, an association for uh, manufacturers of instant coffee might not be the most logical choice for you to find uh, um, potential buyers or, or interesting buyers in, in uh, as their members. So. Um, it, after you define um, the objective of an association and you define like, okay, this is, could be an interesting source uh, for what I have to offer as, as a product, it's very interesting to check their member lists because that's a very rich source um, of information. And on the, the next slide, I will um, show, um, or I will, I will give some examples first of the European Coffee Federation, which is uh, well, on a regional level. Then I will dive a bit more into detail on a national uh, level, the coffee associations. I, will just, I just took two examples, one of the UK, of the United Kingdom, and one uh, of Spain. Um, and after that, I will also have a look at how the Specialty Coffee Association website uh, can be of any use uh, for you and what kind of information you can find on their website. So these websites could be very good sources to find uh, potential buyers in different European countries. Um, and I will start uh, on the next slide with uh, the European Coffee Federation. So as I said, uh, first of all, it's, it's interesting and important to define, their, um, to define their mission because that shows or it gives away a bit of what type of companies or members you can find on their website. So when I read the mission here, you can see mo most of the associations on their own website, they will give, they all have a section and about us section where they share their vision or their mission. And uh, here I copy pasted uh, of their website. And if you read it, uh, I will read it out loud, their mission, it says, the mission is to represent the common interests of European green coffee trades, coffee roasting industry, soluble coffee manufacturers and decaffeinators. So when I read their mission, what do I see or what do I notice? First of all, uh, as the name already says, it gives away the geographical scope that it sources, um, that it serves the interests of the European coffee sector. And then also uh, it serves the common interests of the whole sector, uh, traders as well as manufacturers as roasters. So that gives a, an indication that it's most likely that you will find the larger players in the European coffee sector as members uh, of that federation. So on the next slide, I, um, I uh, made a print screen of, if you on their website, this is all available online on their website, you can go to their member list. And it's quite interesting because they, they have two uh, separate uh, well, options you can choose. On the one hand, you can look into the association members, which is uh, ranked by country. So you can see in Europe, all kind, like all the national as coffee associations that are there, uh, are, are mentioned on the European Coffee Federation website. And by clicking on, uh, on the country you have identified as interesting, you, you, you get some information, you, can, you are redirected to their website or uh, you get some contact details. So that's a very rich uh, source um, to start your search. 
And uh, they also give some information on, um, or they show the company members that are uh, part of the European Coffee Federation. And there you can see, uh, as you already read in the mission, that it includes both uh, coffee traders as well as manufacturers and uh, and roasters. So um, it's important to to check those those companies to see like what they're actually involved in and um, and if they could be uh, useful for you. And I think on, in the next like website, it's uh, sorry, in the next slide, it's best to give an example uh, um, of a national coffee association. And here I picked uh, the, from the United Kingdom, the British Coffee Association. And you can see um, in their mission again, that it serves the interests or what does it, uh, it says, the representative organization for the coffee industry and the voice of UK coffee, meaning that most actors that are involved in the coffee sector in the United Kingdom are part or like are mentioned on the member lists, um, as, as you can see on their website. And by clicking uh, on the membership uh, list, you can find uh, different uh, categories of both smaller uh, as well as larger players. And um, if you click on that, you can see I made a print screen here. They, they give the names of the companies as well as the, like an icon. And if you click on that, you actually get uh, already some, some first information, such as a company biography, um, contact details, and as well as their website of, of a specific uh, company. And here, as Gustavo explained, it's, it's quite important to, to check if such a company actually matches your philosophy or like what you uh, can offer as a coffee exporter or, or producer. So um, if you check a website of a company, it's, it's important to understand their business, their philosophy, and also their requirements. So on their website, you will find a lot of information and you should ask yourself some questions around like, do they buy uh, mainstream coffee or are they more specialized in a niche product such as specialty coffee, maybe organic coffee or fair trade coffee? Um, uh, or do they have other specific requirements on bean quality, cupping scores, uh, packaging, transportation? Most of these, these uh, questions you will find answered by uh, searching uh, the company websites. So on the next slide, um, uh, I, I took as an example the Spanish Coffee Association here as well. Um, again, like most national coffee associations will have a very clear and easy uh, list where they show all their members and um, on, this, on this Spanish coffee association, it's quite interesting that they give the option to filter according to like type of coffee, whether you're interested in players that deal with green coffee or maybe uh, coffee uh, roasters or instant coffee manufacturers. So that helps you like define or refine your search a bit. Um, and again, like by clicking on the website uh, of a company, uh, you can check, uh, for instance, for a roasted coffee company, some roasters do source directly from origin, whereas others uh, buy their coffee uh, through importers. Uh, so it's, these are questions that are quite important to, to, to have a look at and these uh, National Coffee Association websites are very useful sources to, to find buyers uh, or to find players that are active in that specific market. And on, yeah, on, any, on any of these websites, it could be called like slightly different, but usually um, if you go to their members or it says something about um, uh, who we work with or something like that and you will find an entire list of um, of potential interesting companies uh, for you um, and then on the next slide so we've talked about what the uh, regional coffee association the european coffee federation um, can give as well as the national coffee association but if you're mainly interested in or if you deal with uh, specialty coffee, the Specialty Coffee Association is also a very rich source of information. They um, have specific country associations involved in specialty coffee, which they call um, chapters, the Specialty Coffee Association chapters. Here I made a, um, like a print screen of like all the countries that have such chapters. And as an example, I picked Switzerland. Uh, let's say that that's a, a country you're most uh, interested in. If you click on, on, on the, um, 
on like on the, on, on the previous slide you can already see that if you um click just on the name it gives some information on their facebook page or their twitter account or their linkedin or anything related and also uh, it's, it's it redirects you directly to their website so then on the next slide you can see uh, if you enter their website um i will say this website was actually in german i don't speak german nor do i speak any french so as Gustavo in the beginning already explained, it's quite useful to, to use this translation function uh, on your internet browser because many of these association, national association, will be in a language you might not be able to read. But with well, with the tools we have nowadays on the internet, it's quite easy to, to translate it into any language you prefer. So in that sense, um, it's even a richer source of information because everything becomes uh, well readable and, and, and available. So on this website the, the, of the, the Swiss Specialty Coffee Association, uh, if you click on, on their member list, you will see a whole list of all actors that are involved in specialty coffee in different ways. So either in trade, in roasting, even coffee shops. And, um, and as I explained before, um, by, yeah, by, by clicking on these, on these buyers, or on these uh, members, sorry, uh, you can just get a better idea of, 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 of who these players are, like where they buy from, um, whom they sell to, if they um, source directly, like all these kind of, um, of information. Um, and I think, yeah, that's maybe enough for now about the coffee associations. Um, uh, on our on the, on the CBI uh, market intelligence page, you will find uh, yeah even more information on this. Um, but now I want to move on uh, to the coffee festivals and fairs. Unfortunately, uh, most fairs festivals have been cancelled this year due well to the situation we are in today. Um, but still, most uh, coffee festivals and fairs have very you. Um, uh, useful exhibitors exhibitors list of previous previous years as well as, as uh, upcoming events um, so there are many many events that that deal with coffee so it's quite uh, important to first research those events and uh, and see like which market segment they serve because you have uh, specific coffee uh, fairs that deal with all segments and products related to coffee uh, but you have also more general fairs, but then specific to uh, the organic or the fair trade segment. So they deal with uh, these certified products. And you have uh, coffee events and festivals. These are usually more um, directed towards uh, consumers. So they deal uh, with most, most of the time they deal with uh, roasted coffee and even uh, more specific with roasted specialty coffee. Um, but what is important here is uh, if you have a, a, a special event to actually check their main focus, uh, have, like get a feel about their exhibitor visitor profile, who is going to these fairs, who is visiting these fairs, and then um, yeah, ask yourself questions, whether it's directed at consumers, maybe roasters or importers, if it's a focus on green coffee or on roasted coffee. Um, and by answering these questions, you can get a feeling of like, is this an interesting event for me? And of course, you could event, uh, attend these events, but um, if you don't have the means or this year it's all cancelled, it's still a very rich source if you check the exhibitors list and see uh, like what kind of actors um, exhibit or visit these, um, these e events. So on the next slide, I will explain the, um, yeah, we'll just show how you can access these exhibitors list. Um, um, and I use the example of the World of Coffee, the Biofach in Germany, and also the Amsterdam Coffee Festival. And of course, there are other uh, important uh, festivals and, and fairs, such as Coteca in Germany or Triste Espresso Expo in Italy. Or if you're interested in sourcing your coffee or uh, selling your coffee to the US, the Specialty Coffee Expo in, in the United States could be interesting. But I will just use these three examples um, yeah, to show you uh, what you can find on those websites. So first, uh, let's understand, like, if we go to the World of Coffee website, like, what's their focus and what's their exhibitor profile? So if you go to their website, 
I put the, um, the, the print screen, uh, I went to the Y exhibit uh, website and you see right away that it deals with uh, specialty coffee. It's a specialty coffee trade show and it uh, serves all kinds of coffee professional. That means that there will be a whole range of different actors exhibiting as well as visiting, but all related to coffee, uh, to specialty coffee. So coffees that are unique or um, that, that cup uh, at a certain, like a high level. So what I think is quite nice of the world of coffee is that they have a specific, what they call uh, a roasters uh, village. This is like a, a coffee village, which has a lot of small roasters. These are like smaller booths, booths and it's like a market. So if you have very unique high, um, high, let's say 90, 90 uh, uh, coffee that cups 90 plus, uh, it could be, and you want to sell directly to, to smaller roasters. It could be interesting to check this, um, uh, well, I put it like with an orange circle, like to, to check the, the companies that exhibit or the roasters that exhibit uh, in this roasters village. Um, and on, on the left uh, of this, of this uh, print screen, uh, you can see a whole list of, of companies. These are all companies that exhibit at the fair. And by clicking on, on the name, again, you will find, you will get like extra information such as the website or even uh, maybe at some uh, companies that will have um, a contact uh, detail or contact details. And also there's an advanced search where you can look for specific countries. So if you already know, I wanna serve the, let's say the German market, you can just filter only German companies uh, that are active at this website. And, Below, I put the, the links and, and we will send this presentation to you afterwards. So uh, that could even, uh, well, facilitate or make your search easier. Um, I think, yeah, let's go to the next this slide. On um, Biofach, if you deal with organic coffees, it could be interesting to, to check uh, fairs that are specifically dealing with organic products. And in this case, Biofach, the largest organic trade fair in the world unfortunately uh, also this fair was cancelled or the physical fair was cancelled it's it's a completely digital edition this year um but yeah because of this decision they took uh, out the um the exhibitors list so that's why i'm using an example here that is actually from earlier this year from uh, from coco but uh, where 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 i typed coco you can actually type coffee and you will see that you get a whole uh, um a whole list of results and usually uh, when you deal with these bigger fairs and also yeah we serve more a type of products it becomes more important to actually use the filter options to to define i'm sorry to refine your search uh yeah to, so to get a better um, better research to uh, results to to help you search uh for, for interesting buyers mm, i think yeah, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so these are the coffee festivals. There are many co coffee festivals. Here I picked the Amsterdam Coffee Festival. And um, if you have a look at their website, so just click on their homepage, you will get directly a feel like, okay, this is more like a promotional event. It's more a business to consumer event. Whereas the other two uh, examples I showed, the world of coffee as well as Biofach are more, um, business to business events uh, but still it's a very good source uh, of information um, and um, if you click on who's there so here they don't call it uh, exhibitors list or, or or something like that but just who's there and you will see a whole um, list of all kind of actors that are attending the, the Amsterdam coffee festival or who will attend um, the coffee festival next year you can see that there is usually smaller companies, mostly roasters, but there are also uh, specialized importers. For instance, here, right, uh, the first one is 32 Cup, which is a specialized um, coffee importer. They actually changed their name recently to Sukafina Specialty, but it shows that there is a whole range of different um, actors that also attend uh, the coffee festival, although it's mainly focused on, on uh, roasters because it's uh, the event deals more with uh, roasted coffee 
And um, also where, where, where I put the arrow, you can see uh, other cities, because as I said already, the, the coffee festivals are uh, hold, hold in different um, in different countries. So I don't know if you want to export to, to the UK, you can go to the London Coffee Festival, or if you're interested in Greece, I think, I believe, no, I'm not sure, but I believe there's also an Athens uh, Coffee Festival. So there you can see specific um, yeah, companies that attend the fairs in, in these uh, other countries. And again, although this is more like um, a consumer event, it's still a very uh, rich source of information uh, because it can provide you with additional insights uh, into the preferences of European buyers as well as consumers regarding uh, origin, flavor, sustainability, and all yeah, all these kinds of uh, characteristics. Mm. And I think on the next slide we will go to the certification bodies databases, like how you can use these. Uh, um, like tools uh, to search for potential buyers. Um, so you can consult the list of companies handling coffee uh, according to these different certification standards. And I will just explain here uh, organic, fair, fair trade, and the small producer simple, SPP, um, as, as three examples. Um, the organic um, certification. So if you have a, a, specif uh, a certified organic coffee, uh, you can access this website called the Database Organic Bio, which is a, a great website. If you click on where the arrow is, if you type in coffee, you will get a whole um, um, like different types of coffee. Here you can see beans, cappuccino. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, well, that's of course already in. Um, like an end product but you you see different categories which you can even specify your search you also have the option here to say whether you're looking for sellers or for buyers as an exporter you might be more interested in buyers for your coffee um, and you can also um, specify your search um, by um, filtering on country so again if you already know i'm only interested in in, in a specific country you can search for organic actors, organic uh, players um, in specific countries. Um, besides this, uh, the tool I mentioned here, or, or this database, organic bio or bio, you can also uh, other possible sources to find organic uh, uh, actors active, active in the organic sector um, are by um, accessing the organic certification bodies themselves. So yeah, let's go to the next slide on, on fair trade. So um, the FlowSort customer database is a great source of, um, of, um, uh, of information to see the whole, all actors that are fair trade certified. You can filter by coffee, even by type, by Arabica, Robusta, um, I believe also by country. And there you can just see all actors that are involved uh, or that are licensed or, or certified by fair trade um, and here so um, FlowCert is the the accredited certifier for fair trade international but there are also other fair trade uh, standards such as fair for life or ecocert and you can uh, these other standards have their own websites where you can also find the information or players that uh, specifically um, by uh, or yeah, deal with that standard. So, um, and then on the last slide, um, I used the, an example, the small producer symbol, which is a smaller uh, certification standard as compared to, to fair trade or, or organic. Um, and, but on their website, you can find also on the, the database of actors that are, that are involved or that are certified uh, According to the SPP standards, you can see that there are around 44 buyers, which are not only dealing with coffee. So it's quite important to uh, go to these uh, companies and check uh, whether and what kind of products they deal with. Many of them do um, uh, do buy coffee, so it's a good source. And, and the companies that are mentioned here that have usually one characteristic um, in common, and that's that they have like a 
quite a strong ethical commitment and that they uh, search or, or um, find it uh, or value uh, the direct contact with origin. So that's also something by accessing their website and by reading their mission and reading like what the standards, uh, what it stands for, it becomes important uh, or it becomes clear uh, what kind of companies um, deal with that uh, standard. Um, and then the next slide on, um, so I just presented a whole range of website databases to find buyers. But, uh, well, what's next? Uh, it's important to create a system to organize these buyers. So you, like, going through these uh, uh, tools or these search, uh, online search tools, uh, you have identified several buyers maybe as interesting and you should, or I think it's very useful to, to do some, like, a classifying exercise. Um, according to the parameters you find important for instance the profile uh, the markets they are active in uh, the certification they handle uh, quality requirements like all these the parameters you find most important and then to classify like okay does the buyer uh, deal or does it fit my profile what i have to offer and do i like do we have a do we have a match and uh, I think once you are convinced that your coffee is suitable for a specific buyer, I would say approach them. Um, usually trade fairs would be a great way, but of course, due to the current situation, uh, these things are, have become a bit more complicated. So uh, a good way to, to approach buyers would be by uh, sending them a tailored email. For instance, with a complete specification or fact sheet of your coffee, um, and uh, I want to emphasize again, as Gustavo also said, it's important that it's in tailored email because spam, generic emails, uh, aggressive approaches are not much appreciated by, by international buyers and uh, they can uh, jeopardize future attempts to connect, uh, connect with these interesting buyers. So, uh, and also it's, uh, it's helpful and I think it's important to send emails to specific persons and who these persons or people are. Uh, you can find them on the websites uh, of the specific buyer. Usually you can, there's like a web, like a page or on the page, like a section that says uh, who works here or team members or something like that, where you can just look up like who's the sourcing manager or the procurement officer or like uh, one of uh, such profiles. Um, and also, I think when contacting a buyer, uh, it's important to keep your email short, relevant, concise, uh, but always give accurate and, and uh, complete information. And uh, I also wrote follow up, follow up, follow up, because sometimes you don't get an answer, but it's completely okay to, to send like a reminder or uh, if a buyer does not uh, answer to yeah, to, to send a reminder and, and to to ask for, for some feedback or for a reaction. And um, I think, yeah, I think that's uh, what uh, my last, what I wanted to say. And um, I also put the link there again, uh, because on the doing business module on the CBI website, we gave a lot more tips on how to, uh, how to actually do business. Like if you want to approach a buyer, like, what are good uh, good ways, or what what we would think would be a, a good way to approach um, buyers? So thank you, and back to Gustavo and Jantin, I think. Yes, um, thank you very much, um, Lisanna and Gustavo. Um, it was quite, I find it quite interesting and I hope our attendees also found the information very interesting. Um, I think we have some time um, for questions. Um, so I, I have um, gathered uh, certain questions which were uh, put in the question uh, thing. And um, if we, as I mentioned in the beginning, if we do not have time to answer them all, we will answer them after the uh, webinar. We will take time to answer you um, by email. So I um, will start with the first ones. Um, 
it's Gustavo or Lisanne. But the question is, um, how come the Dutch imports or the Netherlands imports from Belgium are so high? Is Belgium a re-export or a processing country? Both. I mean, some buyers from Netherlands and those from Netherlands are just using the Antwerp port uh, in Antwerp, Belgium, which is also quite big, just to import and then this coffee is brought to Netherlands or it stays in Belgium. But Belgium is not one of the large roasters in Europe. It is a large roaster, but it's not one of the largest. So a lot of this uh, coffee that is imported into the port of Antwerp is redirected to markets such as Netherlands. Thanks. Um, other question that um, we have is, um, have you identified a market that is currently short on supply for coffee? Ah, that's I the think gold I found that quite an interesting uh, question because I think it's also <laughs> out of well, it's out of two interests, but I also think it might be interesting with the situation we are now at the moment in with the COVID that there's yeah, uh, we might have a, a different supply demand. Uh, some countries are in full lockdown or 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 partially in lockdown, so maybe you could clarify a little bit also on that, um, Gustavo. It's, it's yeah that we might also have a bit of a different market? Or do we really see a certain market that is really short on supply or, or maybe the other way around is very long on supply? Yeah, it's, it's hard to tell because it of course depends on the type of coffee, on the market segment and niche that we are talking about. Of course, that we see a concentration in, uh, let's say supermarket coffees and like the premium coffees in supermarkets because people have changed their uh, consumption patterns a little bit so i think we can expect more consumption of good grade like good quality coffees that are actually certified we do see an increase in uh, the certified coffees that are sold through supermarkets that do have like a superior quality but not top quality uh we do see a problem right now of course in the specialty in the 80 plus in the 85 plus segment that cons consumption has dropped and we do see an increase in the uh, commercial uh, type coffees that are certified. I think this is a general uh, picture, but of course, we depend per market and a little bit on the possibilities in specific countries. Uh, but this is the general picture. Thanks. If um, Lizanne yeah. wants to comment, I don't know if she has anything to add. Another question that we uh, receive is. Um, how does the retail market of coffee works in Europe? So how can they approach supermarkets? Um, it's not an easy um, uh, market, I think, but um, the question is, how, what are the possibilities for them and how to approach them? Maybe we can explain a little bit on the different channels. Yeah. Um, I think when you're talking about supermarket, then you're talking about various different channels because it could be that a supermarket like the Albert Heijn here in the Netherlands has a, its own roaster, but it doesn't mean that it sources all its origins directly. It could be that Albert Heijn through its roaster is either important directly or through an importer. It depends a lot per origin. Uh, sometimes when a roaster has a good presence and agents at origin, they do it directly but sometimes they do not, so they do it through an importer that brings it and nationalizes this coffee. So they have a hybrid system, so it's difficult to tell this is the way. So you have to look per supermarket if they have an integrated roaster and how this roaster sources, or it could be that a roaster also does the private label roasting for the supermarket. So then you would have to approach this roaster that does private label. Uh, it could be that this roaster that does private label sources directly from origin depending on the origins or does it through an importer as well. <laughs> so you have to look at all possibilities and uh, you have to realize that um, some of these roasters, they do have sometimes even a subsidiary at origin and other oranges, they're, they're not even there. So they prefer to do it when the product is already nationalized or if they need the lower quantities of a specific coffee, they do it through importers, for example. So it's very mixed uh, landscape. Uh, I don't know if you want to add the team because I think we had this discussion before also. <laughs> yeah, we indeed had the discussion before and I agree with you, um, Gustavo, that um, approaching um, the supermarkets or the retail, um, that, that there are different channels to indeed um, approach them. Uh, if you 
I would maybe would like to add, if you do get in contact with um, if somebody interested in, in coffee, um, you might enter into the discussion of what, what, what kind of coffee they need, what kind of quality they need, and then you can discuss so what channel are they using to source their coffee and that you you basically work together in the value chain how to source then this coffee so it might be that you are selling to a retailer or to a supermarket but that the that it goes via a certain importer because they facilitate the financial part the logistics um pricing system yeah so i i believe very much um that you create together this value chain um and respect them um how that value chain is uh, being done to to reach your coffee to the end buyer yeah and i think in general what we do see is that for supermarkets specifically you're not talking about the top top quality you're talking about good quality and consistent quality this is very important uh because we're talking about volumes that need to respect a certain profile through the years because consumers they buy this coffee because of its consistency as well etc plus uh we do see an increase for coffees especially within the private label certification and some kind of sustainability proof uh because this is type of uh, a type of risk management for these big companies the big retailers they do need to manage their risks sustainability risks yeah and i think i just see a question coming in is um how long will it take um to get to a contract with a buyer that, that might also be interesting because um some people think that you can immediately make a contract with a between a seller and a buyer but i think in generally in coffee it takes a little bit a longer time so maybe we could explain um a little bit in generally then of course because there's always exceptions but uh, how that works a little bit yeah uh, I think it also depends on the segment because if you're talking about specialty, almost for sure, uh, if you're talking about uh, a small roaster, they will want to visit Origin, they will want to do some kind of mini audit, and even for larger roasters. So you have to include that into your calculation of how much time it takes as well. Uh, I think for, let's say, mainstream coffees, you do work sometimes with future contracts and you are uh, sourcing in a different way as well. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, like, it really depends on the segment and the type of contract that you are, you're setting. Is this contract decommatized? For example, is it in the specialty segment that you do have a big differential? Or is it in commodities that the price paid is standard and then your time to close the contract is just the time that you're managing this uh, uh, inventory? So, I, I wouldn't know how to specify, I don't know if anyone wants to add something, but you have to realize that sometimes your contact with a specialty buyer for example might take a longer time to consolidate and it might uh, translate into smaller volumes for example than with a big buyer yeah i agree then i think um this might be one for for lisana is um in this situation we are um we are currently in you see that um in, in certain sectors you have um uh, virtual fairs um, coming up or have been held in the meantime or people are trying to organize are there any virtual fairs um for coffee i'm sorry i was on mute um in general what what we see is that there are Many or some of the trade fairs um, actually have gone online, but if you look at specific at coffee trade fairs, uh, they have been cancelled. And this is, I think, partly due because uh, because of in these events uh, for coffee, usually they have this element of cupping and and the, and the tasting. So um, it's it's like world of coffee, and like most of the coffee events are actually postponed to next year. So specific to coffee, maybe. Gustavo knows, but I think they have all been postponed to next year. Um, and for instance, a Biofab, which is on organic products in general, but they uh, they they have a digital fair, but this is not specific on coffee. So yeah, I think some of the festivals they are happen like the cupping uh, festivals and the awards they do happen in a way online as well. But the actual sourcing, the conversations that you have with buyers, etc. I think that these websites, as we explained, they give you the tools, but they, I, I don't think they're organizing as in other sectors. I, 
to my awareness, they are not organizing uh, the matchmaking online. But uh, yeah, we have to look into that. But in general, the events and the specialty events specifically, they have been postponed for next year. Yeah, and I think um, you, still for the attendees, it's very good to uh, to take the examples of uh, Lisanne. We will be sharing the presentation. We have a lot of questions on that, but uh, we will send it out so you can have a look at the examples. And you, there you can check uh, what they uh, facilitate and what they offer um, at the moment while we are in the situation of not being able to attend these kind of, um, of, of these fairs. Uh, Gustav, another one we have is uh, how to identify types or grades that are critical to um, to the EU buyer. So how how do you know that your coffee um, applies to the uh, to the requirements of the EU buyers? Yeah. So the minimum legislative requirements, let's say in terms of mycotoxins and stuff like that, you have to look at the. We have a, a module on our market intelligence platform that uh, talks about requirements so this is about the minimum legislative requirements and then you go to a level that will depend on the buyer because there are there is a buyer for everything if you are uh, if you're complying with the minimal requirements that legislation says then you have buyers that are focusing on uh, bulk and then you have the specialty buyers the certified so then you have to start segmenting your product usually if you go to the buyers that have uh, usually importers uh, if they have a list of coffees, they do have the qualities and the different specifications that you can also compare the coffees with. So I think this is a, a nice exercise to do. But importantly, just keep in mind the minimum requirements you do need to meet in terms of the pesticide residues, in terms of the mycotoxins. So this is given on the CBI website as well. Thank you. And we have, um, how can they check, um, because we were talking about certified, non-certified coffees, or, and certified being, uh, being fair trade, or oats, or rainforest, um, whereby, of course, the fair trade prices, we have the fee that you have to pay is fixed, and with oats, rainforest, it's, it's uh, flexible. But is there anywhere they could check um, what kind of pricing system is behind the certified coffees? Although that is quite difficult maybe to answer because there are so many um, other issues that um, compile the, the total price of, uh, of green coffee. But maybe we can explain a little bit the differential, the what well, the, the New York price or London prices, and in generally a little bit how it works certified compared to non-certified. Yeah, for certified, as Yun Ting said, if it's fair trade, there is a minimum price plus a uh, fair trade premium. Plus, if it's organic, there is an organic differential as well on top of that. So this is the price composition for a fair trade certified according to the flow cert and according to all the fair trade systems. Uh, fair for life, for example, it's based on cost and production. So you do discuss that with the buyer and then you come to a price which is fair to both sides and that recognizes also the quality, the work that it takes. Uh, in organic, of course, uh, the margin would uh, vary a little bit according to the prices of the coffee because uh, these margins, they come on top of the, the New York prices. So you could expect 10, maybe 15, up to, I guess, 20% on top of these prices. So uh, I think the one that will fluctuate here would be the organic differential because it comes in as a margin on top of the of the prices uh what are the certifications uh, yeah these are the main ones the woods uh which is now reinforced alliance does not guarantee a uh, minimum price or a margin necessarily because they do work more with productivity with good agricultural practices etc and the question was also so can they check somewhere or verify somewhere these mm. prices on, on, on a yeah. kind of a site or do do they need to um, check all the, the websites from traders who are offering these market these these coffees and so or would there be a centralized website where they can find these kind of or at least the explanation uh, on the, the explanation itself, we do give an indication already on the certified co uh, coffee uh, fact sheet we have, and we have a new organic 
uh, fact sheet as well on the CBI website, where you can kind of check a little bit on what is in these dynamics and uh, the kind of buyers and the kind of prices you can expect. Um, but I don't think there is a central, we try to centralize this information on the CBI information actually, because it's not centralized. Yeah. It's something that you need to search. I think um, there is a, I'm just at the meantime, I'm looking it up because I forgot the name, but I think it's called the Transparent Coffee Guide. Um, it's mentioned in one of the fact sheets we wrote, and it gives a lot of information, like transparent information on, on prices that are uh, paid uh, along the chain um, from producers to, to buyers. So that could be an interesting source to have a look at. Uh, at prices paid along the chain. I'll have a look and I will leave it in the in the chat box. But I think there's a difference between, let's say, if you're talking about differential based on quality and the differentials or the premium that it's they are paid for the certifications. Uh, because Absolutely, the certification, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, the certification is a third party audited certification that gives a premium on top of the prices in order to value that coffee in relation to the impact regarding social, environmental impact, the differential on quality is a different story. I mean, that's the price composition based on quality purity, not on certification necessary. Yeah, exactly. It's good you, you clarify because it's yeah. two different things, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I think I, we should repeat a little bit that if you go to our website, you find quite some information and, and I think even more uh, a lot of links that can help you to have to understand better um, the, and, and get there they give explanations on, on how and, and you can find out how you can uh, apply that to your, to your uh, product or your company. Another interesting question actually is, uh, especially uh, based on the situation we are now, is that um, how do we see the out-of-home uh, consumption? Is it, it Has it drastically diminished or has it moved to online coffee buying? Or uh, So how do we see that market for now and maybe a little bit uh, towards the future? Yeah. Um, I don't know if Lizanne wants to pick this one up and I com complement or... Sorry, go, go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, okay, so I think, as I said, I think coffee consumption is quite stable in general when you look at the big picture and then you start seeing, of course, the auto consumption has dropped uh, because uh, part of consuming coffee out of home is actually to sit in a cafe and to work from there, etc. I think uh, these have been partially replaced by more supermarket purchases and by ordering the coffees to be consumed at home from these coffee shops, but this is just partial. I think, uh, let's say, there are, there are a lot of articles about this, so we're trying to centralize the information, but from a personal perspective, I think as soon as we have a vaccine, as soon as we are able to go to coffee shops again, I think out of home consumption is the trend. It is something that is a long-term uh, prospect, and I think it will continue. And this is, of course, there's a dip at the moment because it's just not possible to go to a, um, a coffee shop, you, dis, you do see more possibilities to consume uh, higher quality coffees buying from supermarkets or buying directly from these coffee shops through deliveries. And a lot of these coffee shops have created websites, portals, so that you can order this coffee online as well, or that you're walking the street and then they give you this coffee. But of course, the general consumption, out of home consumption has dropped also through offices and things like that that are not working at the moment. But again, I do see a long-term uh, trend for out of home. I think this is a temporary situation and I think it will pick up as soon as we have a solution for this problem at the moment. Uh, I want you guys to also comment and maybe to give your opinions because here I'm talking also from a personal observation and perspective. <laughs> No, I agree uh, with you, Gustavo, that, um, that this is because of the, uh, of the current um, situation that we are in, because uh, the out-of-home uh, coffee consumption uh, was growing, uh, especially in certain European countries, um, it's becoming more and more uh, popular, uh, increasing of, of qualities, um, what we name specialty coffees, which is still a little bit of a grey area because it hadn't had it's still not defined what is exactly specialty coffee, but at least you see in the higher segment 
movement uh, that there is a growth and people really do want to know where their coffee is coming from. They want to know the story behind it. So I, I, uh, I agree with you that um, as soon as we get into a more normal situation um, for how, whatever that time takes to get to that situation, I agree with you that that, that will normalize um, again. Yeah, um, I, I do not think, uh, just to orient in, I, I don't think that f uh, compared to other markets, the ordering a coffee online, etc., will pick up as much as we have seen maybe in the specialty chocolate, for example, or in other sectors that you do have opened up this channel now. I think for coffee, it's such a strong thing to go to a coffee shop and consume it there because uh, specialty coffee is also about the experience. Yeah, and I think the next question that we have is a little bit in line with this. Is, is the question is, what is the breakdown of online and offline uh, business to, to consumer sales of coffee in uh, Western Europe? And I, I assume that they mean by offline is that um, well, online buying and offline is, is the, the other consumption. If we could have a breakdown of that. Well, I don't have this figure. I think it's something that is fluctuating so much currently. We had a, before the second wave here in Europe, we had a point where people were back to the cafes because they were open again. So it's fluctuating so much right now uh, that we, I, don't, I, I don't dare to give a ratio at the moment because it's something that is very variable um, and something that will change once we have a vaccine or maybe in the course of this pandemic. So I don't dare to give a, a ratio. So, I also see uh, a question uh, coming in, um, and I think it's a little bit in line with, um, you know, how long does it take to get to, to contract with a coffee buyer? Um, somebody is, is asking about uh, finding buyers. It could take years, in especially in the United Kingdom market. I don't believe that. Um, to find your buyers, it should take years. Um, so maybe we should clarify again that finding buyers, um, you have different channels, how to find your buyers. And that once you have found buyers, sometimes they have long-term contracts for a certain supply of coffee. And if they would like to change that into supply, it can, sometimes it can take a little bit longer before you can actually start a contract. Uh, maybe we could clarify that still yeah. a little bit more for our attendance. Uh, what is the exact question? The difference between finding and consolidating a contact. Yeah, that, it does not mean that it has to take years to find buyers, but you can find buyers, but then entering really into a contract, that could be a certain um, uh -huh. uh, gap. Um, that can have all kinds of reasons, like you're, or they already yeah. have a contract or they're not in that coffee at that moment, but maybe within a half a year or a year? Uh, I think you also, uh, what you mentioned, Yantin, that sometimes they have specific suppliers, they need to you know, finish a contract with those or not really, they need to keep the contract, but then expand their assortment, for example. I think currently it's a bad moment because a lot of buyers, they are uh, revisiting their inventory and they are looking into what is even feasible. So it's hard to open up new origins, for example. Uh, and at the same time, I think a lot of buyers are also thinking, what are my options? Because some buyers did have some problems with their supply chains, uh, especially in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it's very hard to say because I think some reason not to be accepted by a buyer could also be, for example, if they see that you don't have a CSR policy or something like that. So I think my recommendation here would also to make yourself interesting as well and to work on some things that you do see that they value, such as having a very organized CSR policy or uh, having a clear management structure to your company and have documentation to prove that. I think this can be also tools that you can use to uh, have your differential in this in these markets. Uh, but it's hard to say because indeed you have so many options and I think you should also look into diversifying. Uh, if a buyer does not want to work with you, as Lizanne said, you can follow up, but you shouldn't harass someone and you should diversify your options as well. Yeah, and maybe also very check very much your uh, corporate social responsibility within your company, which is becoming uh, more and more important. It was yeah. already important, but it's becoming more important. And it will become even more important within the coming years. 
because I think that's on top of, of uh, every agenda that um, yeah. we should have corporate social responsibility uh, well, increasing basically within your company. So that might be also something that they could diversify uh, themselves into to have that um, very well organized. We get, yeah. we get quite some um, questions on uh, roasted coffee. Um, um, I already explained that that's a little bit a different market and that our webinar is based on green coffee and not roasted coffee. Um, so for certain questions on roasted coffee, I already diverted them to the European, we European Union website. So like, for example, labeling issues, uh, yeah. requirements, uh, or let's say the legal requirements. Um, yeah. I know it's not, it's, it's, it's different um, uh, subjects, but as the questions are keep coming in, um, yeah. is there something that we can divert them to on websites where they can find their information? Yeah. No, I mean, um, yeah, well, th there are initiatives to try and work on this market, such as the AFPA in France, the Agency for the Valorization of Agricultural Products. Basically, they work on uh, contests for roasted coffee at origin. So this is a channel. This is just looking at this kind of possibilities. But when you're speaking about roasted coffee, think of the following. Can you be as competitive on the European market as a European roaster in terms of quality, in terms of packaging, in terms of innovation logistics? These are questions and representation uh, because you're going to have to sell this coffee to uh, retailers directly, to retail channels directly or through a distributor so you're not talking about the usual coffee trade you're talking about already reaching a consumer market think about the subjects before you think about the european market can you achieve volume as well uh, to justify for your investment because you're going to have to transport this coffee by plane the transportation costs are going to be very high on top of your uh, uh, production costs and your other costs that you have in in making this coffee um, Compare the price that you can get for your coffee plus your profit margin with the coffees that are already on the market to see if you're competitive as well. These are some of my tips. There are a few initiatives for, for roasted coffee. There are some brands on the market, but this is still a small market. We are looking into it in different programs, in different initiatives, and also in our market intelligence. Uh, I think you guys will hear more about this maybe next year or the year after. But for now, uh, think about these subjects. <laughs> think about these aspects. Yes, thank you, Gustavo. We also get quite some questions on certain origins. Um, so what would be a good market for their coffees? Um, an example is for Indian coffee. I think we should, um, yeah, you should check also our studies on um, to see on, on the European countries what kind of coffees they are already importing. Yeah. And if that would be matching the quality that you are looking into from your country or from your origin. Um, or do you have any more to add on how they could verify if their coffee would be interesting for that certain country or certain region? Yeah, I don't know much about the offer, so it's hard to say because sometimes not even so much about the origin, but also the where, which market are we talking about? Because you do see, for example, uh, an increase in high quality robustas, for example, which uh, from India, maybe it's something to work on, but I don't know if this is the case for this coffee we're talking about, so it's hard to locate it in my mental map. Yeah, and we did also get some questions on uh, on quality uh, questions on, on or how to grade coffee. I, I diverted them no, um, to yeah to the specialty coffee association uh, website where and and to see how you maybe can become a Q grader on on Arabica and since a, a few years you can also become that on Robusta, which is quite interesting. I think um, that that you are able to come. A, become a Q grade on Robusta is that there you can learn the, the gradings on all the kind of coffees that are basically um, yeah, produced around the world because it's quite a lot of coffees and all the coffees have their own um, uh, specific uh, specifications. So I think that the best is to check these uh, websites to see um, yeah. how to qualify your coffee and, and maybe also um, to even uh, become a Q grader yourself to understand um, your buyers in Europe um, and that you basically talk on the same uh, aspects about your coffee. 
and that will also improve your chances to have a good relationship with your client. And price your coffee correctly as well, because then you're able to locate it and compare with other taste profiles. And then you start having the understanding how your coffee fits in the range of the whole coffees of the world, so to speak. Yeah. Then um, I think we're going to um, um, round up a little bit um, due to the time. Um, so again, all questions which have not been answered yet, we will answer them later to you. Um, there was also a question, and it's it's coming back a little bit now, is um, to recommend to to work with an agent in Europe, for example, or to or preferable with an importer. I believe that that depends also a little bit on the relationships and on on the on the countries uh, that you would like to sell your coffee to. Um, but I would recommend to check our website, our um, uh, module on especially on the channels and the segments that we describe very clearly on on how to work with an agent or why you should work with an agent or why you should work with import or why you should maybe work directly with the roasting uh, company um, you can find um, very detailed information on that and um, then the last question is um, how to interpret the differentials for the for example on fob or cif basis but i think that depends um, very much on your contract basis how how you agree with um, your buyer, uh, what kind of contract? But maybe we can explain a little bit um, what would be the advantages or disadvantages, um, especially for origin countries. Yeah, I think it's some buyers better to do FOP or to do CIF. I think a lot of the buyers will have their arrangements with the logistic companies, so they will have their already. Uh, ways of doing it with the uh, insurance and the freight already done so for these buyers of course you would uh, quote FOB but uh, as you said it depends on the type of contract yeah. uh, I think I think this is also explaining the doing business the advantages and disadvantages uh, I think when you're look at, when you're looking at uh, CIF you should look at the type of insurance you're getting as well and if you want to be responsible for uh, the insurance yourself and it's going to be of course more responsibilities on your shoulders as well um, yeah i don't know if you guys have anything to add on that uh, i think a lot of the buyers are asking you to quote fob uh, if you're talking about the bigger buyers and if you're talking about buyers that have a specific presence at the origin Yeah, I agree with you, and I think uh, I, I pointed out a little bit is to make to be aware indeed of when you sell on an on a free on board basis or on a CIF basis that there is indeed quite a difference, and your responsibility is bigger than also if you sell on a CIF basis. So it's more that you need to be prepared to handle these kind of contracts. Yeah. Um, I would like. Um, to thank all the attendees that were in today uh, on this uh, coffee webinar. Um, I, I think it was very nice to do it and um, to share our uh, knowledge, to share our information. Uh, I would like to thank um, Lisanne and Gustavo very much for um, uh, taking up this uh, presentation and, and have all this information and, and be able to, to answer quite a lot of questions. So um, thank you very much for that. I hope um, you enjoyed all very much the webinar. Uh, we will um, have more webinars in the short term. Um, uh, we will post these all on our website, on the event site. And of course, um, we will invite the people when we will have another um, webinar. So uh, keep an eye on that. Um, again, thank you very much. And well, for the people who are already in the night, have a nice evening. We're in the morning, have a nice day. And in the afternoon, um, have a nice afternoon. And we hope to welcome you uh, soon. Um, please, um, at the end of the webinar, please fill in the survey for us because it will be of great help to organize the next webinar even better. So enjoy the day and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
bye bye